God called me to preach. He was eight years old, he put his hand upon me, and I never turned back. I've never questioned his anointing. I've never questioned the authority of the word that he gave me. And I can say like Jeremiah, he made my face like a flint. And I've never cared what people thought about the preaching. I just preached what God told me to preach. And that's exactly what I intend to do again this morning. And I would say to you that God called me to be a messenger. I'm one of his messengers. And every man who stands in this pulpit of the unction and anointing of God is a messenger. And he is called as an oracle of God. And when he preaches, if he's under the anointing and God has called him and he's living an overcoming life, it's not his word, it's the word of God. And it's to be accepted as the word of God. And it's to have an impact on our life. And it's meant to change us. Now, in any given Sunday, anywhere in the United States, when the word is given, there are various and curious uh, responses to the word. And I want to talk about that this morning. I, uh, when I talk to you this morning about mocking the messengers, uh, I have in my mind Proverbs 17:15: He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abominations of the Lord. That means that I can't stand here in any, at any time. I cannot make those that are living in sin feel comfortable. I can't justify the wicked. On the other side, I cannot condemn the righteous. So I'm not here to preach condemnation this morning to those who may have uh, an honest uh, difficulty in trying to understand some of the preaching of the word, whether it's in this church or anywhere else. It's not that they're mocking the word, but they don't understand it. And I'm not talking about that. So don't put any condemnation upon yourself when you hear the word. Open your heart and we'll try to open it this morning so you fully understand what it means to sit in God's house and mock the message and the messenger. Now, mocking the messenger of God was the number one tragic sin of Israel when they heard the word being preached. Nearly every generation of the Jews of Israel, every generation was guilty of this mockery. And it expressed itself in various manifestations and I want to talk about some of those manifestations this morning. How Israel mocked and how that's still the problem today. How people who sit in God's house, some totally unaware that they are mocking the messengers. Now, Jeremiah was one of those mighty messengers that God had called. The Spirit of God came on him. The Bible said the word of the Lord came to him. You read that about all the prophets. The word came to him. The word came to him. Folks, I know that Brother Carter and myself, we stand here. I can tell you, the word came to us. We didn't get it out of a book. We didn't get it from somebody else. We didn't borrow somebody else's words. We got it from the Lord. The Lord, the word of the Lord came to us. The word of the Lord came to me this week, and that's what I'm delivering to you this morning. But he got so upset, he got so bothered and frustrated by all the mockery of his message and all of the scoffing from God's people he made up his mind to quit preaching. He said, I quit. Who needs this? I've been mocked and I've been scoffed and I've been ridiculed enough. Lord, I quit. No more. Well, let me read it to you. I am in derision daily, Jeremiah 20, verse 7 to 9. I'm in derision every day. Everyone mocks me. The word of the Lord was made a reproach to me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him anymore. I am not going to speak anymore in his name. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement. I've had it. I've been mocked. I've been ridiculed. I know I preach the mind of God. And when I preach it, the people don't receive it. He said, that's enough. He stopped preaching for a while, evidently. But there was a fire kept burning in his bones. A message the Lord would speak to him and he couldn't keep quiet. In fact, he, he said after the fire began to burn in his bones, he said, I couldn't keep quiet anymore. That's in verse 9. I couldn't, I could not be quiet. I know what that's like, folks. There have been times I said, Lord, I don't want to prophesy anymore because they call me a doomsday preacher. I don't want to talk about it anymore. And I would be quiet. And then the fire would burn in my bone. I'd have to go out in the woods and prophesy to the trees. One of the great causes of mocking God's messengers is the preaching of repentance, number one. This is where most of the mockery comes. 
No message is more mocked than the preaching of repentance in the church today. And even in evangelical circles. No preacher is more ridiculed than the preacher who preaches holiness and repentance. Nobody loves a Jeremiah. Nobody. They don't want a Jeremiah today any more than they wanted a Jeremiah then. But it was Jeremiah's preaching of repentance that brought all of this mockery and scoffing upon him. Now, there's a story uh, in Second Chronicles, the 36th chapter. In fact, I'd like you to turn there, if you will, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, 36th chapter. And leave that chapter open on your lap, if you will, please. I'm going to be referring to that as we go on now. Uh, in this episode, in Second Chronicles, the 16th chapter, we find that the Chaldeans have invaded Judah, and they've surrounded Jerusalem, and Zedekiah the king has been warned, and all the people of Jerusalem have been warned by the prophet Jeremiah. He said that it's all coming down. He, he said the judgment of the Lord is here. And the Bible says they thumb their nose at the message. Don't turn there, but Ezekiel 8, 17. They put the branch to the nose. Now look at me for just a moment, please. In Bible days, they used to take a branch or a stick, hold it under the nose and flip it. That was an absolute form of scorn, the, the lowest form of scorn possible in that society. We in modern society threw away the twig. We used the thumb. We call it thumbing the nose. And the Bible said they put the branch to the nose. He, he said, I come with this message, and they're thumbing their noses at me. They're thumbing their nose at the message. And, folks, there is a lot of thumbing of the nose at the gospel or the preaching of repentance in the church today. Now, Jeremiah comes on the scene, and these people are under judgment because of their idolatry. In fact, the Bible says they're worshiping the sun. They turn to the east every morning. They had even horses that were dedicated to the sun god. And they were worshiping the sun god of all things. Turning to the east, that they worshiped the sun toward the east. Ezekiel 8, 16. Now, the Bible said, the people said among themselves when they heard Jeremiah preach, they, they responded, well, God has forsaken the earth. In other words, God doesn't see us anyhow. The, the, the place has been abandoned. God doesn't answer prayer. He's not around anymore. He has left us. He has abandoned us, so we turn to our own gods. And the word, in the midst of that, the word came to Jeremiah in Second Chronicles 36, 15. Read it with me, please follow me. Verse 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up in betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Now look this way, if you will, please. This is the compassion of God. A people who are worshiping the sun. A people who have turned totally to idolatry. A people who have hardened their hearts and closed their ears to the word of the Lord. And yet God, the Bible said rising up early. And when it says rising up early, that doesn't mean five o'clock in the morning prophesying. Doesn't mean early morning meetings at five or six o'clock. What it means... Rising up early is rising up before the time of judgment. God would rise up early before the judgment came. And he would send these prophets. And Jeremiah is sent to proclaim a word to Zedekiah and to these backslidden sun worshippers who called themselves the children of God. And the Bible says he had compassion on them. Folks, the passionate message that God can deliver to his body. Those who appease you, those who flatter you, those who say everything is okay and they won't reprove you, they won't talk about your sins, they won't make you uncomfortable in the house of God. These are not the men of God. That's not the word of the Lord. That's the worst thing that could happen to you. Preachers can damn your soul and send you to hell by not preaching conviction. The preaching of repentance is God's greatest act of mercy. This city, uh, eight, nine years ago, was, it, it was in the worst degradation in its history. 42nd Street was rife with porno shops, X-rated movie houses up and down 8th Avenue and 42nd Street. 
the, the murder rate was out of control. They were throwing babies out of windows. Remember, about eight years ago, the, the, the 20-year-old kid in Brooklyn threw his baby to his Rottweiler dogs, and the baby was devoured. Things that were unheard of. God should have sent judgment. New York City deserved it. This nation deserved judgment. But what does God do? Comes down in the middle of Times Square at the crossroads of the world, and he sends servants, he sends messengers out of compassion. God raising up this church and every other church that preaches the gospel in New York is absolutely an act of compassion from the heart of God. It's the compassion of God. God raised this church up not to condemn New York City, but as an act of compassion to preach mercy and grace and conviction for sin. And folks, when, when I say preach mercy and grace, that's repentance. Folks, the first four years we came here, that's the only thing we preached. Repentance, repentance, repentance. And then when people began to repent, God came along with grace and mercy. But I say the repentance preaching is grace and mercy all along. How many believe that? Hallelujah. Verse 16. But they mocked the messengers of God. And that's where my message comes from. They mocked the messengers of God despised his words, misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Now when it says they mocked until there's no remedy, it doesn't mean that God pulled away his mercy and grace. It says they have so hardened themselves that the grace, of mercy, grace and mercy of God cannot penetrate their hardness. They themselves made it without remedy. I want you to follow me now. What does it mean they mock the messengers? There's not a word here about them making cat calls or hissing or standing up and interrupting his message. I don't believe that's what it means. I, I believe it was just sitting there listening to this man and say, I can't accept that. I, I don't want to hear that. Folks, I traveled for years in advance as preaching repentance and soul saving grace. And, and uh, preaching about New York City and its problems and what God was doing, saving drug addicts, alcoholics. Now, who's going to fight a man preaching about God saving alcoholics and drug addicts? That's like fighting the American flag and apple pie. But when God told me to go forth and prophesy, I tell you, I heard something else. I got it from all sides, from preachers and uh, written statements and everything else. Mr. Wilkerson is a doomsayer. He's he, he just a negative preacher. He has no mercy. He, he's a negative preacher. And I heard that, and it stung me. It stung me terribly. But you see, the mockery that we're talking about here, they mock the messengers of God, is that they, they, they just said, we, we don't and will not accept it. I don't see it that way. I've had many people come to me over the years say, well, Brother Wilson, you're earnest, you're sincere, and I like the way you preach, but I just can't buy it. I don't see it that way. Even though they know that I, I preach as an oracle of God, I hear that from others who, who attend this church even. You know, it amazes me that Zedekiah will refuse totally to hear the message of repentance but he has this curiosity about prophecy, about what's going to happen in the future. He has nothing to do with Jeremiah's preaching of repentance, but he calls him secretly on two occasions. And he says, he, he says, right out, uh, let me read it to you here. I've got to find it here in just a minute. Here, here it is. Uh, is there any word from the Lord? He said, no, I don't want you to tell anybody you're with me. He said, if you do, it'll cost your life. But he said, What's laying ahead? Tell me. Is there a word from the Lord? On two occasions, and the next time he met with him, he said, I will ask thee a thing, don't hide anything from me. He's not talking about don't hide anything about repentance. He's saying don't hide anything about the future, what's coming. Folks, we can stand here and preach about Armageddon. We can preach about what's going to happen to Israel, and people will sit on the edge of their seat. But the moment I start preaching about their pet sins, about laying down their lust, I don't want to hear it. Back away. It's mocking the messenger. That's what God's laid on his heart. That is so, we have people so interested in prophecy and what's going to happen to the Jew, what's going to happen to America. 
I, I have some of the most reprobated people in New York if they find out I'm a preacher. Uh, Mr. Wilkson, what's God saying about the future? I say, he says, repent. Folks, when you turn off the message of repentance and refuse to deal with your sin, and refuse to hear his loving call, because that's a, a mercy and grace message, you are mocking the messenger. He's wasting his breath. You're mocking the messenger, and you're mocking the message. Simple as that. I say it lovingly, but that's the way it is. We, we have people that, that come to this church. They love the singing. They love, they love it when we preach everything but repentance. And when we really make things uncomfortable, this should be the most uncomfortable church in America. I, I mean, in, in, in New York City, this should be the most uncomfortable people living in their sins. But God does that because He loves you. He does. If you're sitting here this morning and you've got sin hidden in your life, you've got a pet sin, you've got a lust that has a, a controlling interest in you, it's just possessing you. And the Puritans called it a bosom sin. If you've got a bosom sin, then you're going to be very, very uncomfortable. In fact, you're most uncomfortable right now. And I'm not trying to be facetious, but that's God's Spirit. That's the Spirit of God. That's His grace, His mercy, His love trying to bring you out of that place where you can receive the Word. You can sit and say, preach it, Brother Dave, because I'm clean. You never again have to sit uh, uncomfortable in a church again when there's ministry on repentance. Now, let me go to the second manifestation that is still very... Uh, prominent in the church today. There's a special kind of mockery that has to do with a false commitment to truth. This kind of mockery of God's messengers is found in uh, uh, Jeremiah 42. Would you turn to Jeremiah 42 with me, please? Now, if you love the Word, you'll flip with me. I mean, flip the Word. Jeremiah 42. Now, folks, while you're finding that and leave it open on your lap, let me, let me lay the foundation for the episode here, if you will, please. The Chaldeans under Nebuchadnezzar have already invaded Israel. They've taken Israel captive. But when the Chaldean army came, many people fled. They escaped. They went to the hills. They went to other countries. All right, now... There's only a small remnant of poor people, and those who, who left the country are moving back now. And there's a, a remnant that's come back into the land. The land is devastated. Jerusalem is in ruins. Judah is in ruins. And the Chaldeans still have some garrisons in the land. And uh, they have a captain they have appointed, and they are planning to migrate to Egypt. And on the way to Egypt, they stop near Jerusalem, and they find that Jeremiah the prophet's there. And they, they take a ten-day uh, rest to hear what God is going to say. They come to Jeremiah. And this is an amazing thing. And let's read the first six verses. Then all the captains of the forces in Johanan... Uh, and, and all the people from the least even unto the greatest came near. They said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let me beseech thee our supplication, let we beseech thee our supplication, be accepted before thee, pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us. That the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk, and the thing that we may do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I've heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Look at me, please. Is there anybody in the Scripture that sounds more 
willing to obey the word of the Lord. We are in your hands, Jeremiah. You go to God. You ask him direction. We will go any way God tells us, even if it's a negative message. You don't line up with what we feel is right. We'll go God's way. We are totally surrendered. Go to God. Get the word. We will receive it 100%. How many come to church just like that? They boast, I love God's word. Pastor Dave, anything God says, I'm ready to obey. I will obey the word. I love the word of God. I love reproof. I love, love, love the word. Ten days are spent in seeking the face of God. And here's what God said, Jeremiah, tell them and warn them. Don't go down to Egypt. Egypt's going to destroy you. Stand still here in Judah and see the salvation of the Lord. Don't act in fear. Trust God. Now, folks, listen very, very closely now. If you are sitting here in this church this morning, say, Brother Dave, I am committed to hearing and obeying the Word of God that's preached in my church or in Times Square Church, if this is your church. I am fully committed to the Word of God. You better mean that. You would better mean that. That means that I am going to apply it to my heart. I'm going to obey the Word. I'm going to let it change me. But there are many people that have a false commitment to the truth. These people said, we are ready. And Jeremiah gets the word. Now, folks, we see in what Jeremiah received from the Lord, the whole gospel in a nutshell. The whole gospel in the nutshell it, 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 it is, is very, very clear. It's right here is to accept the word of God, to believe the word of God, and don't go to Egypt. Repent and stay away from Egypt. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Don't go back to your old ways. Don't go back to your stubbornness. Don't go back. Hulk, it amazes me the, uh, the number of Christians that say that they're totally committed. They love the Word and they're going to obey God. And they really think that they're obeying God. But certain areas in their life have not been touched by the gospel that's preached from this pulpit. I, we stand here and we cry out against things like pornography. We, we warn the men. We see, man after, we see one man after another fall to this. One, go deeper and deeper into sin and pornography. And, and we, we have men that, amen, every time we mention it. Amen. Preach it, Brother Dave. And go right out and get a, a X-rated film and stick it in their VCR. Or go down here and pick up the magazines and, and nothing's changed. And some of them have been sitting here four or five years here in the message of time and time again saying, I love the truth. But it's a false commitment to the truth. Now things are going to really get quiet here in just a minute because I want to talk about. You know, we we we, we literally stand in this pulpit weeping and broken and warn you of the dangers of gossip and slander. We literally cry it out because we know God's word and God. We hear the word of the Lord and we feel God's anger toward that and we warn and we warn and we have people nod their head. Yes, yes, I will never do that. I, God help me. That's not me. Go right home and get on the phone. And you see them in little groups. Then you know, you can see them going like that. You know what's happening because your spirit tells you. See, that gossip doesn't hurt the pastors, doesn't hurt the leadership, it hurts those who are involved. We just go right on. The Lord keeps speaking to us. God keeps blessing. But you see, that's mocking the messenger. That's mocking the message of God. When you don't allow it, you don't hear it. You know, I, we, we have uh, young people. I've had young men come back here and hug me. But they, boy, that was a wonderful message. And I've just been, I remember one time preaching about roving eyes. And I had a lot of men lined up hugging me. About roving eyes. I said, boy, that, that really grabbed me. You go out the back door, and there's three or four of them standing right there, just hug me. Somebody goes by, and here they go. <laughs> they just hug me. just said, I love the truth. Didn't impact their life at all. And, and, and they're saying, we, we, we want to hear God's word. You see, after 10 days, he comes to him. 
uh, Jeremiah knew all along. He said, you lied to me. You, you dissembled in your heart. You lied to me when you sent me to God. He said, I'm going to give you the truth anyhow. And sometimes men have to stand in the pulpit and preach the truth, whether anybody's going to receive it or not. They can't go home and say, how many received it or how many rejected it. The call of God for me as a minister of the gospel is to preach the word, whether anybody receives it or not. It has to go forth. Thank God for those who hear it. Thank God for those who obey the word. Hallelujah. But our message is still, stay away from Egypt. Hallelujah. And all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord, so they came and went to the land of Egypt. They Not only did they reject the message, they, they called him a false prophet. Now, how, how do people in ten days change like that? Just ten days before, he's a great man of God, the only man with the answer, the only man of great respect, it seemed. And now, ten days later, because, see, they never did intend to bend God's way. They were trying to get Jeremiah's blessing on what they had already planned. They wanted God to bless their plans. If you come to church and, and, and you, you say, I like the music, uh, and, and there's something in your life that you're holding back on God, and, and suddenly the Holy Ghost deals with you, <clears throat> And you, you don't let the word find its mark in you. You know what you're going to do if you don't yield? You're going to keep going from church to church to church until you find one that you can sit there and be comfortable and nobody touches it. You've got this nice little hiding place. You can raise your hands. You can praise the Lord. You can talk in tongues, but you can keep your little idol. God help you that never be able to keep that idol in this church. That God, by His Spirit, would probe and dig. That you would receive the living Word of God. And not just say, I love the truth, but live it. And say, God, I, I want to accept it with all my heart and everything that's in me. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise God. Now, we come to the worst and most tragic form of mockery. And that's flattering the messenger and despising his message. Oh boy. Ezekiel 33. You still with me? I'm not yelling at you. How many believe we still love you? That your pastors love you? Okay. I'm proving it now by telling you the truth. Ezekiel 33. I'll start verse 30. Ezekiel 33, verse 30. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls. Now, folks, the original Hebrew says they're talking, or they talk concerning you. And, and this against is not the connotation of the original Hebrew. The connotation, they discuss your preaching is what it means. They're discussing you by the walls and in the doors of the houses. And they speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as the very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but they do them not. Now listen to me close is one of the hardest, toughest, stone-faced prophets in all the Bible. He's a hard preacher. He's got a hard face, and God made him that way. God made him that way. Behold, I have made thy face hard against their faces, and their fo thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As a stone harder than flint have I made your forehead. Don't be afraid of the people. Don't be dismayed at their looks. Though they be a rebellious house, I have made thee a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Folks, I, I uh, can only imagine what it was like in, Jer in Ezekiel's time. This man is known as a hard preacher. This man thunders like few prophets in the Bible thunder. Ezekiel has a countenance that... I mean, if he looks you in the eye, he sees through you. 
This, this man could not be bought. This man didn't care what anybody said about his people. He loved people. He loved, the, he loved his nation. He was a very godly man who loved the people. And he, he knew he spoke, spoke as the oracle of God. They flocked to his meeting. They, 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 they can't stay away. And the Lord said, Son of man, the people, thy, thy people converse or talk about thee by the walls and in secret in their houses. Now, the text suggests that they, they admired this man. In fact, it says that they loved him in verse 31, for with their mouth they show much love. You know what they're saying? They're going around saying, have you heard, have you heard Ezekiel yet? My goodness, that man skins people up and down. This, this, this man, you've got to hear, come, they said, let's go hear Ezekiel. And they come to him, the Lord says, look, it, look at them. He said, they sit there, and they're really impressed by his voice. He must have had some powerful voice. He preached well, like someone that plays well on an instrument. They said, they love to come and hear you preach. Folks, we have people come from, from all over the city. They like to hear the choir. They like the life. They like the vibrancy of the service. And, in fact, they, they love the preaching. I mean, the harder it is, the more they seem to like it. And they tell their friends. They tell it like it is down at Times Square Church. They really preach the message there. You ought to hear Brother Carter. He lays it on the line. Doesn't compromise. And they're, they're coming. He's the man of about town. I mean, everybody talking about this preacher. And they come to hear this man preach. And folks, it must have been something for that crowd to gather. I can just imagine on any given Sabbath when they gather on the hillside to hear this prophet at his appointed time. He's not appeared yet and everybody's sitting there expecting this man to walk down because this man has a countenance, uncompromising. You see him with his rod approaching down the road. And they said... Last Sunday, I mean, he preached about adultery, and he scathed. You should have seen men leave this place with their head hanging down. Boy, did he scathe them. I wonder what he's going to preach today. And they, they can't wait for this man to preach. And while he's preaching, they smile and they say, Hey, man, preach it, Ezekiel. Preach it. They love the messenger. They said, with their mouth, they show much love. They love the messenger. You know what God says? But lo, you're to them just like a lovely song of one that has a pleasant voice. You play well in an instrument, for they're going to hear your words, but they will never do them. Worst form of mockery there is, is to love your messenger and despise his message. Just ignore his message. Those people heard the strongest message on earth, anointed, piercing, and get up and talk about, are you being, you coming next Sunday? I'll be there to see how many we can gather, see if we can get all of our friends and let's come. This is powerful stuff. I walk out unchanged. How many have been coming to this church four or five years? You're still doing the same thing. You haven't changed. You, you see me on the street, you see Pastor Carter, you come up and hug and say, Pastor Dave, thank God for Times Square Church. Thank God. I don't know where this city would be unless God had sent you here. Go around the corner and pull out the cigarettes. <laughs> Folks, serious business. It's serious business to come to God's house, claim that you have a commitment to the truth, and claim that you are ready to obey and to love the church and love the pastors and not obey what they preach. Now, folks, you know that I never close on a negative note, if I can help it. I'll give you the good part now. Hallelujah. Anybody ready for that? <laughs> the honest believer, if you're here and you're an honest believer, you know what you're saying to yourself right now? 
Oh God, I don't ever want to be guilty of mocking your messengers. I want to hear and obey the word of God. Let me tell you what's necessary then. Let me give you just a few simple things God put on my heart, how you can know as you sit here this morning that, that you are one of those who have not and will not mock the messenger of God. It, folks, it's not necessary going out and talking about your pastors. That's the easy part. The really terrible, tragic thing is to allow us to come here with a word right from the throne of God and preach with the Holy Ghost just, just saturating us. The word going forth in purity and power. And you just sit there and smile. And you don't let it penetrate to your heart and change you. That is the worst. That bothers me probably more than anything else. Now, let me give you the good part. Look this way, please. All right? The Berean Christians, and I'm, I'm, just give me ten minutes here and we'll be finished. The Berean Christians not only received the word with a ready mind, but they went home, got out their scripture, and tested it. The scripture says, they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You know what they did? They came to God's house and there was anything that they disagreed with or didn't understand. You know what they did? They said, well, look, I may understand it, but I'm going to go home and search this out. He's got me thinking. And so they would go home, get out their scriptures, and they would test the word of God. Folks, that would be wonderful if every time we preach this pulpit and any question you had, Folks, God, the Word answers the Word. You get the answers right here to go home and say, well, I don't quite understand that. Don't go to the pastor to say, explain that a little more. Go home and ask the Holy Ghost to explain it to you and test it from the Word of God. Now, Paul called that kind, those kind of people noble. He said they're more noble than the Thessalonians. And, and he, he said they're, they're more noble. Folks, there's a nobility about a church and a people who come Having a prepared mind, the scripture said, they were prepared to receive the truth. Before they came to church, they prepared, they were praying, God, open my mind, open my heart. No matter what is preached, God, prepare my heart to receive it. And then if they, it was difficult to receive, they took the second step, God, I, I haven't fully received it, but when I go home today and get the scripture out, and the rest of this week, open it to me. Folks, anything that's preached from this pulpit, if it's really of God, will stand your test. It will stand the test. It has to stand the test. God, give us more testers. Test Pastor Carter. Test me. Test our speaker seven. Test everyone who preaches from this pulpit. Take your word and go test it. And if you find anything that doesn't match up, bring it to us. We'll deal with it right away. I mean, we'll take it to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, oh, folks, I'll tell you something. I have to tell you this. Here in Times Square Church, I have seen a great nobility of hearers. Hearers have a, an absolute noble spirit because I see the way you sit there. And it, you're drinking it in, and I know the majority of you have never mocked the messenger or the message of God, and there's a tremendous nobility. You bring your Bible, not just so people can see it. You just don't wave it to say, I'm a holy person. You come ready and, and willing to say, God, speak to me. And most of you have been changed by that word, marvelously. Most of you are not what you were a year ago even. You have been changed by the word of God. And I thank God for that nobility. You've given a dignity to the preaching and the word of God. We thank God for that. But for the word to be effective, what we preach has to be received as the word of God and not of man. Listen to it, please. First Thessalonians 2.13. When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. He said, in other words, for my message, Paul saying, to be effective to you, you have to be fully convinced that I heard from God and what I preach is not my heart, but God's heart. And folks... No preaching from this pulpit is going to have an, be effective in your life unless you can honestly sit there saying, I trust this word as coming from God and not of man. Folks, I, I'll, I'll stand against every devil in hell. 
And I'll stand up and say, not one of you can accuse me or Pastor Carter. We don't get our word from other men or books. I told you that Oh, we, we consult the books to look for some local color or, or dates and things like that. But we hear the word and the mind of God. And I'm telling you now, the word that you hear preached from this pulpit is the mind of God. I speak as the oracle of God. Pastor Carter speaks as the oracle of God. And for it to be effective in your heart, you have to believe that. You can't sit there and say, well, uh, you know, some of it was from God, but there was one two things, that, that's not God. And, and you sit there judging whether it's man or God. You can't, it, the word cannot be effective. It, it, to be totally effective, you have to be convinced, I am hearing as the oracle of God. <clears throat> if you believe we speak for God, if you believe we're the oracles of God, then the Bible says you'll pray for us. Let me read it to you. Brethren, Paul said, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even it is as it is in you. And basically what he's saying, if you accept our preaching is from God and not from men, and if you're prepared to hear and you go home and test what you hear, then you will pray for us. You will hold us up because you say, that I am being fed. It's changing my life. Oh, God, I pray for that source. I pray for that channel of blessing. God, don't let anything touch my, my channel of blessing and the word, the convicted. Thank, listen, if you, uh, beyond this church, you visitors, I don't care what church you're from. If you have a pastor in your pulpit or pastors who provoke you to righteousness, preach repentance and holiness, and the true grace of God that leads to repentance. You ought to be praying for that man or those men every day of your life. You ought to say, oh God, keep them from the wicked one. Keep the blessings flowing. Keep the revelation coming to my heart because I'm being changed by it. Keep the revelation flowing, oh God. Folks, we covet your prayers. We can't make it without the prayers of the church and the body of Jesus Christ. And many times when the enemy came in the flood, I could feel the prayers of God's people all around me. Hallelujah. In closing, I can say with Paul the Apostle, and I know Pastor Carter can too, but I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not after man, for I, never re I neither received it from man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. God separated me from my mother's womb, and he called me and revealed his son in me that I may preach Christ, that I may preach him. God called me from the womb. Folks, there, I tell you, there has never been a time that I've stood in this pulpit and doubted the word that God gave me. I never doubted that he would bless it. I never doubted that I'd heard from God. I heard from God this week. I preach to you today as the oracle of God, and God giving me grace and keeping me humble before Him and righteous before Him till I die. I want to be able to say with Paul the Apostle, I fought a good fight, and I preached the mind of God. I, I sought the Lord till I heard His mind, and I delivered it. If I boast, I boast in the Lord only. I boast in His power to, to move upon the hearts of men. Hallelujah. I thank God for raising up this church. I thank God for raising up a remnant of people who want to hear the Word of God and they want to be changed by it. Hallelujah. I want everybody that's been, I mean, truly, powerfully changed by the Word of God this past year, even if you're from another church, the Word of God has changed you and you know it. I want you to stand, please. I want you to stand. <laughs> Now let everybody stand, please. Don't want to put anybody on the spot. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, now I've preached your mind. I've preached your word. And I pray, Lord, that those who've had a hard time receiving the word of God over the past weeks or months, that you melt their hearts. And, Lord, you call to repentance those who need to repent. Hallelujah. I want our, our musicians, if you come, if you will, please. Hallelujah. Folks, bow your head. Just keep your head bowed.
before the Lord right now. I want you to sing with me, Oh, How I Love Jesus. And let's just wait on the Lord. I, I know He has something to say to us, and we're going to obey Him. I asked the Holy Spirit, I asked the Holy Spirit what He wanted now. And we obey Him here. And here's what the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart, and you can receive it or reject it, but I know it's His mind. Balcony and here in the main floor. If you're here this morning, and there's one area in your life that's still unsurrendered, untouched. And God in mercy and grace has been really speaking to you. The worst thing that can happen is that you've made peace with something in your life. And you, you, you've just said, I don't want that area touched. You made peace with it. That brings a judicial blindness on you. That will bring a, a blindness and a hardness that you can never receive the word again. You just get comfortable with it and say, well, there's no problem. I, I know the Lord loves me. And, 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 and you turn the grace of God into lasciviousness because that one area God's dealing with. And God wants that surrendered this morning. You've got to repent of that one thing in your life that holds back the joy, the fullness, and the blessing of God. I want you, as the Holy Spirit deals with you, to get out of your seat. Balcony, just go to... to either stairs on either side come down any aisle we'll wait for you but folks I know that many of you have heard God speak to you many times God saying come on now I, I want that I want to give you victory I want to bring great peace to your life I don't want you living in a guilt and fear and condemnation folks if there's something in your life that you've made peace with and you don't even feel the guilt anymore God help you God help you don't let that happen run to the Lord run to him today and say oh God I don't want to get hard in this area in my life. I'm going to lay it down. If you don't know the Lord, if you're backslidden, come with these that are coming now. Just get out of your seat and come and follow these. What a loving Savior we have. Folks, move in close to make room. You that have come forward, move in close. Please, that's it. Just move in close. Hallelujah. Oh, how I love Jesus. Here it may be visitors, but you're here and God sent you here this morning. And I want to tell you straight out, what the Holy Ghost told me. You're running from God. You're running from the Holy Spirit. He's been trying to reach you. You knew Him. You had a touch of God, but you've been running. And God says, no. Right here in the middle of Times Square, you stop running. You stop running in this meeting. You stop running right now. Folks, that's his loving call. I want you to get right out of your seat, whether it's a balcony or here on the main floor, and just ease into the aisles, if you will, please. Uh, uh, from the balcony. Oh, I feel this so strong in the balcony. But other places, young person, middle-aged, seniors, whatever it may be, don't walk out on the Holy Spirit. He is so patient and loving. What a wonderful opportunity to get it settled. You know you want to come. Obey him now. Step out as we sing it. Sing it just two times and then we, the invitation is closed. Holy Spirit, thank you for speaking so tenderly to the hearts of these who have responded. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the great love of God that you represent to us. Oh, Holy Spirit, the work that you've begun, finish it now. Holy Spirit, come right now covenant Savior, covenant Christ, come now and give power over sin in this meeting. Oh God, give hatred for sin. Help us, Lord, to obey the Holy Spirit and by His grace let the Spirit of God pluck out that one thing that stands between us and freedom. Lord, do it now. Let the Spirit of God come mightily upon the people. Look at me, please. For all of you that are here, I'm going to have you pray a prayer with me. Now, this prayer is not going to be any impact or effect unless it comes from your heart, unless it becomes your prayer, not mine. Unless you can honestly say, this is my prayer. And the Lord knows why you're here. He sees it all. Everything we do, remember, we do it before the throne. We do it before the eyes of God. Nothing is hidden from his eyes. So it's best to just tell him, nobody needs to hear. Don't mention your besetting sin. Don't mention that one area. The Lord knows. It's, he saw when you walked down, when you made your way down here, God was already 
waiting and prepared to give you all the grace and strength you need. And that is the covenant. That's the covenant. God said, if you'll repent, I'll send my spirit, I'll infuse my spirit into your heart who has all the power you need to overcome sin. I will give you the will to do it and I'll give you the power to do it. You and I don't have any power to break our sins. You and I have no power to lay down anything. God has to come and empower us by His Holy Spirit. You know what I'd like you to do? Just close your eyes and pray this prayer right out loud. Everyone who's standing out, everyone who made a move toward the altar, pray this from the depths of your heart right now. And I promise you, if you pray it sincerely before the Lord, He's going to hear it and He's going to, He's going to do something about that now in strengthening and healing you. Pray it from me, from your heart. Jesus, there's an area in my life I've been holding back on. And I don't want to hold it anymore. There's a besetting sin. And I acknowledge it. And I repent of it. And I don't want to get comfortable with it. I want freedom. I want to be delivered. Forgive me, Jesus. I lay it down at your feet. Send the Holy Ghost. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. And O oh Holy Spirit, give me all the power I need to overcome the enemy. That I may live a life of freedom. Freedom from the power and clutches of sin. I believe you, Jesus. And I trust you for it now. I want everybody to lift both hands and thank Jesus right now to answer your prayer. Lord, I thank you. You will come with power and authority. Break the power of sin. Break the chains that bind. Lord, we speak against those chains. We speak against that, that, that thing that holds. Oh God, you have all power. Nothing is impossible with our God. Lord, you're going to make us free. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. Listen, if you're praying that in faith, joy ought to come to your heart now. Joy will come. Lord, let the joy flow. God's faithful. God is faithful. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message.
Sulita Moro Wa Tori Ni Ke Era Ru Kyone Furubita Omode No Hokori Wa Haru Moro Rana Sia Wase Ka Arukoto Wa Moro